who have had a hard enough time of it in the pitiless deserts of the Rocky Mountains. Heaven knows. If we cannot find it in our hearts to give those poor naked creatures our Christian sympathy and compassion, in God's name, let us, let us at least not throw mud at them. Chapter 20, The Great American Desert, 40 Miles on Bones, Lakes Without Outlets, Greeley's Remarkable Ride, Hank Monk, the renowned driver, Fatal Effects of Corking a Story, Bald-Headed Anecdote. On the 17th day, we passed the highest mountain peaks we had yet seen. And although the day was very warm, the night that followed upon its heels was wintry cold, and blankets were next to useless. On the 18th day, we encountered the eastward-bound telegraph constructors at Reese River Station and sent a message to His Excellency, Governor Nye, at Carson City, distant 156 miles. On the 19th day, we crossed the Great American Desert, 40 memorable miles of bottomless sand into which the coach wheels sunk from six inches to a foot. We worked our passage most of the way across, that is to say, we got out and walked. It was a dreary pull and a long and thirsty one, for we had no water. From one extremity of this desert to the other, the road was white with the bones of oxen and horses. It would hardly be an exaggeration to say that we could have walked the 40 miles and set our feet on a bone at every step. The desert was one prodigious graveyard, and the log, chains, wagon tiers, and rotting wrecks of vehicles were almost as thick as the bones. I think we saw log chains enough rusting there in the desert to reach across any state in the Union. Do not these relics suggest something of an idea of the fearful suffering and privation the early immigrants to California endured? At the border of the desert lies Carson Lake, or the sink of the Carson, a shallow, melancholy sheet of water some 80 or 100 miles in circumference. The Carson River empties into it and is lost, sinks mysteriously into the earth, and never appears in the light of the sun again, for the lake has no outlet whatever. There are several rivers in Nevada, and they all have this mysterious fate. They end in various lakes or sinks, and that is the last of them. Carson Lake, Humboldt Lake, Walker Lake, Mono Lake are all great sheets of water without any visible outlet. Water is always flowing into them. None is ever seen to flow out of them, and yet they remain always level full, neither receding nor overflowing. What they do with their surplus is only known to the Creator. On the western verge of the desert, we halted a moment at Ragtown. It consisted of one log house and is not set down on the map. This reminds me of a circumstance. Just after we left Julesburg on the Platte, I was sitting with the driver and he said, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City, he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture at Placerville and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolt jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage. And then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier. He said he weren't he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you, and you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. A day or two after, we, after that, we picked up a Denver man at the crossroads. And he told us a good deal about the country and the Gregory diggings. He seemed a very entertaining person and a man well posted in the affairs of Colorado. By and by, he remarked, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City, he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture in Placerville. He was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk 
cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat. He finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage, and then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier. He said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, Keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. At Fort Bridger, some days after this, we took on board a cavalry sergeant, a very proper and soldierly person indeed. From no other man during the whole journey did we gather such a store of concise and well-arranged military information. It was surprising to find in the desolate wilds of our country a man so thoroughly acquainted with everything useful to know in his line of life, and yet of such inferior rank and unpretentious bearing. For as much as three hours, we listened to him with unabated interest. Finally, he got upon the subject of transcontinental travel and presently said, I can tell you a very laughable thing indeed, if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City, he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture in Placerville and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage. And then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier. He said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you he did too, what was left of him. When we were eight hours out from Salt Lake City, a Mormon preacher got in with us at a way station, a gentle, soft-spoken, kindly man, and one whom any stranger would warm to at first sight. I can never forget the pathos that was in his voice as he told in simple language the story of his people's wanderings and unpitied sufferings. No pulpit eloquence was ever so moving and so beautiful as this outcast's picture of the first Mormon pilgrimage across the plains struggling sorrowfully onward to the land of its banishment and marking its desolate way with graves and watering it with tears. His words so wrought upon us that it was a relief to us all when the conversation drifted into a more cheerful channel and the natural features of the curious country we were in came under treatment. One matter after another was pleasantly discussed and at length the stranger said, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley went over this road once. When he was leaving Carson City, he told the driver, Hank Monk, that he had an engagement to lecture in Placerville and was very anxious to go through quick. Hank Monk cracked his whip and started off at an awful place, pace. The coach bounced up and down in such a terrific way that it jolted the buttons all off of Horace's coat and finally shot his head clean through the roof of the stage and then he yelled at Hank Monk and begged him to go easier. He said he weren't in as much of a hurry as he was a while ago. But Hank Monk said, keep your seat, Horace, and I'll get you there on time. And you bet you he did, too, what was left of him. Ten miles out of Ragtown, we found a poor wanderer who had lain down to die. He had walked as long as he could, but his limbs had failed him at last. Hunger and fatigue had conquered him. It would have been inhuman to leave him there. He paid his fare to Carson and lifted him into the coach. It was some little time before he showed any very decided signs of life, but by dint of chafing him and pouring brandy between his lips, he finally brought him to a languid consciousness. Then we fed him a little, and by and by he seemed to comprehend the situation, and a grateful light softened his eye. We made his mail sack bed as comfortable as possible and constructed a pillow for him with our coats. He seemed very thankful. Then he looked up in our faces and said, in a feeble voice that had a ter tremble of honest emotion in it, Gentlemen, I know not who you are, but you have saved my life. And although I can never be able to repay you for it, I feel that I can at least make one hour of your long journey lighter. I take it you are strangers to this great thoroughfare, but I am entirely familiar with it. In this connection, I can tell you a most laughable thing indeed. 
if you would like to listen to it. Horace Greeley, I said impressively, suffering stranger, proceed at your peril. You see in me the melancholy wreck of a once stalwart and magnificent manhood. What has brought me to this? That thing which you are about to tell. Gradually but surely, that tiresome old anecdote has sapped my strength, undermined my constitution, withered my life. Pity my helplessness. Spare me only just this once, and tell me about young George Washington and his little hatchet for a change. We were saved, but not so the invalid. In trying, to in trying to retain the anecdote in his system, he strained himself and died in our arms. I am aware now that I ought not to have asked of the sturdiest citizen of all that region what I asked of the mere shadow of a man, for after seven years' residence on the Pacific coast, I know that no passenger or driver in the overland ever corked that anecdote in. When a stranger was by and survived, Within a period of six years, I crossed and recrossed the Sierra between Nevada and California 13 times by stage and listened to that deathless incident 481 or 82 times. I have the list somewhere. Drivers always told it. Conductors told it. Landlords told it. Chance passengers told it. The very Chinamen and vagrant Indians recounted it. I have had the same driver tell it to me two or three times in the same afternoon. It has come to me in all the multitude of tongues that babbled the grief to earth, and flavored with whiskey, brandy, beer, cologne, sazodont, tobacco, garlic, onions, grasshoppers, everything that has a fragrance to it, through all the long lists of things that are gorged or guzzled by the sons of men. 